Hi, and welcome to this first in a series of videos that is all about producing the hammer or the positioning hammer. And well, that's what we call our positioning hammer project. And it's our introduction to lathe work project. Today we're going to start to look at the handle. And well, for that, I think we should get acquainted with it. And we'll start by looking at the drawing. And well, the first thing that we notice is that it isn't a drawing, but two drawings. And the first is the assembly drawing. Assembly drawings are important. And there's, well, three main reasons why they exist. The first is to give an indication. I think this is the most obvious of how the different parts of the project assemble. Where do they fall one in relation to the other? The second is to give us overall dimensions. Now these overall dimensions are only there to give us an impression or a feeling of the size of this assembly. No tolerance applies to these overall dimensions. And the third, well, is to give us a bill of materials. The bill of materials is a crucial part of the assembly drawing because the information that you'll find in the bill of materials doesn't usually show up anywhere else on the detailed drawing. And that crucial information is, well, the part's name, the part's ID number, the quantity of each part in the project, how many do you have to produce, the minimum overall dimensions of the blank or rough part before you start machining, as well as the material used to produce each part. You'll also find things like the tolerance, the name of the person who designed the project or produced the drawing, the project's number, identification or name, as well as the drawing's scale. A good example of the type of error that can occur when you don't pay attention to the bill of materials is when a person produces the wrong number of parts. In other words, they produced only one unit when they should have produced two or three. Now, the part that interests us for this video is the part number two. I can see that by the identification balloons on the drawing. If I look at the bill of materials for part number two, I'll see that its name is handle, that its overall rough dimensions, the minimum ones, 19.5 in diameter and 237 millimeters in length, and that the material required is cold rolled steel. If we now take a look at the detail drawing from left to right, now on the left end of the part we can see that we start with a number 3 center hole. And that's followed by a threaded portion, M10 by 1.5. Then I have a 3 millimeter groove. I have a shoulder and a 4.7 millimeter radius that leads into a taper. At the end of the taper, I have a knurled portion that incorporates two 3 millimeter grooves. And the right-hand end of the part is surfaced, drilled, and reamed to 12 millimeters. If I look at the dimensions, I notice that, with the exception of the 12 millimeter diameter hole, all the dimensions have one number after the decimal point. And if I look down here to the tolerance, I realize that the tolerance for those dimensions is going to be plus or minus 0.3 millimeters. However, that 12 millimeter diameter hole, well, it has to be a lot more accurate. And its tolerance is uh, 0 0.05 or 5 one hundredths of a millimeter. And it's very important not to forget to read all the notes on the drawing. I have four notes on this drawing. The first note has to do with grooves, as does the second one. The third note has to do with heat treatments. And our fourth note has to do with the knurling of the handle. Now, we have a series of videos that teaches us how to plan out uh, a project. Uh, a sequence of operations. And while this is really the introduction to the lathe project, it's after the drill point gauge probably the first project that you're going to attack. 
And well, that means that it would be really unrealistic of me to expect that you are at a level that would permit you to plan this out. You have to remember that it's not just machining, but the order or sequence of operations that permits you to get to the, where you want to go, your completed part, successfully. It's very easy in machining to paint yourself into a corner and not to be able to complete a part because you performed an operation properly but in the wrong sequence. So I have right here the sequence that we can look at visually because I have the part as it progresses. So let's take a closer look at that. And well here we have our first step. It's our blank part and it's been cut off on the saw and it's oversized as far as its length goes compared to the other parts because while well, I have to leave some material on the ends for surfacing to get those reference ends correct. Here we have our second step and we have here our surface part put two lengths at length number three center hole, number four center hole and our part is ready to go here. So that's at its final length already. Then we have our third step where we have our knurling. So it's basically the same part but we've performed the knurling. It's important to put that to do that now because everything that comes after this weakens the part. This is a forming operation that requires a lot of pressure so we really want to be our part to be as stiff and as rigid as possible. Here's the next step where we basically have the same thing but as you can see we've grooved, drilled and reamed the hole in the handle to lighten things up and we've started to turn the end for the thread. Then we see a new evolution where this end stays the same but I've threaded, grooved and grooved the part for the final operation that is turning the taper from the bottom of that radius groove right up to the edge of where the knurling is supposed to end. So these are the operations that I'm going to produce. In our first video, well we'll only get to about this level here and then we'll move on in our second video to about this level here and then our third video we're going to complete this here. So let's get to it. First thing to do is to deburr both ends of the bar that was cut on the cutoff bandsaw. Now we're ready to start machining on the lathe. And we can start by setting the part up in the three jaw chuck for surfacing. The first thing that we want to do is to create a reference surface. I have two ends here and they've been cut with a saw. They're not really precise or accurate and I can't measure accurately from them. So I want to surface one of the two ends. Which one doesn't really matter. However, once it's surfaced right away to save setups, I'm going to come and center drill a number three center drill. Then I'm going to pull the part from the lathe and I'm going to head over to the layout table and using the surface that I just produced as a reference I'm going to come and lay out the overall length of the part. Then I can come back here and reinstall the part into the three jaw chuck. With the second surface the one that hasn't been cut yet sticking out from the end of the chuck. And in this case I'll surface it as I did the first side. But instead of just surfacing to make the part flat, I'm going to surface up to the line that we laid out previously. And that'll be the overall length of my part. The tolerance on the overall length is quite loose. So laying out and cutting up to that line is more than accurate enough. Then before I pull the part from the lathe, I'm going to come and center drill, but this time I'm going to use a number four center drill. We'll see why we use a number four here. We used a number three on the first end, and we'll see why we're using that number four when we get to the knurling operation. So let's get to it. Yeah. 
Now you may have noticed that I didn't let the part stick out very far from the end of the chuck. And I did that on purpose because I want the piece to be as rigid as possible for this surfacing operation. Now we want to install our general purpose turning and facing tool in our tool holder because here again, just as I didn't want the part to stick out too far to maintain rigidity, I want my tool to be as stiff as possible. So I won't let it hang out of the tool holder any more than it has to. Since set screws can slide quite easily on hardened tool steel, you'll want at least two set screws to hold your tool in place. There, that's nice and tight, but I still have two things to adjust, the angle and the height of the tool. I'm going to start by adjusting the angle. And for that, I'm going to first loosen off the nut that holds the tool post in place. And we can adjust the tool post's rotation in a way that presents the tip of the tool to the surface that I want to cut. Now, in this operation, all we're doing is surfacing. So I'll put it something like that. Now, I have here a good attack angle, something around 40 degrees. Now, I want to tighten the nut down firmly. I don't want this to turn once I start to cut. And you can see here that the end, if you like the tool nose radius or the tip of the tool, call it what you want, is the closest thing to the surface that I want to machine. What I don't have here is the height. It's not properly set. So let's take a look at that. Now, we have a video that talks about setting the tool at the proper angle and the proper height. So it would probably be a good idea to go and take a look at that. But for now, I'm just going to keep it simple. What I want to do here is purposely set the tool just a little lower than the center of rotation of the part. And I'm going to do that by eye, and well, I've already done that here. Then I'm going to come up to the part and just lightly surface, and that'll leave a little boss on the end of the part here. And I'll use that boss to help me center it more accurately. But before we look at that, we'll have to talk about speed. Now, this is a bar of free machining steel, C12L14, and it cuts very easily. So we'll be using a speed around 550 RPM. You can see that little boss that was left. I'm going to guide myself on that to do a finer adjustment, making it smaller and smaller with every pass until it disappears altogether. So here I have a number three and a number four center drill. The number four is slightly larger than the number three. Now for this end, we're going to want to use the number three and make a smaller center hole. So I'm going to chuck this center drill in the drill chuck and then, well, I'm going to back the cutting tool out of the way. I'm not using it, so I shouldn't leave it somewhere close to the chuck. I don't have to run after trouble. But I'm not going to remove it, not just yet. I still have some surfacing to do on the other side. And, well, this tool is already set up, so I'm going to leave it on the tool post. There, I can lock my tailstock in position and drill that hole. I'm going to end up with a hole that's small and parallel at the start and then V-shaped. And I'm not going to come up to the edge here of that V because I don't want the main body to penetrate the surface of the part. That's going to give me a small hole at the bottom and then a V-shaped hole that can be used to support the part with a center. Now, this is quite a small hole, so I'll have to increase my RPM. We're going to go from around 550 that we were using for the surfacing, so I'm going to crank that up to around 1200 RPM.
Now I can back my tailstock out of the way. I can pull this number three center drill from the drill chuck and replace it with the number four because I'm going to need it when I do the other end. Now I want to back my cutting tool out of the way because that'll make pulling the part from the three jaw chuck a lot safer. And remember to check that your emergency stop is engaged. There, that's one end done. It's also my reference, and well, it's going to remain the reference for the whole of the machining process. To accentuate the marks or the lines that I'm going to produce here on the part, I'm going to use a small amount, and I mean a small amount, of layout blue or layout dye that I'm going to apply here in a very thin, light, almost translucent coat. And I don't have to apply it to the entirety of the length or diameter of this part. So I'm going to put a little on the end here, that's the business end where I'm going to be grooving and threading, a little bit in the middle here, I'll need a line there as well, and a very small amount at the other end. This is my reference end, and this end, well, I haven't surfaced yet, so I know I have very little to take off. And in this area, I'm going to be laying out a line that's really just a guide that's going to tell me where the end of the knurled portion of the handle will be. So, one line here at 15 for the turning and the two grooving operations. Remember that this is the reference end, and one one line here as an indication for my knurling, and one line here for the overall length, which is 236. So 15, 133, and 236. So with my reference on the surface plate and my part mounted in this V block for stability, and with my height gauge set to zero on the surface plate, I'm going to set the layout tip of the height gauge at 15 millimeters in order to lay out that first line. So, I have my first line at 15, and that's going to be my threaded end. My other lines are up here, and I don't want to flip my part over because, well, my reference is on this side. The next line is dimensioned on the blueprint as being 103 from this end. Well, if it's 103 from that end, and this is 236, well, that's going to make it 133 from the reference end. So. I'm going to have to stabilize things here since the line that I'm laying out is way over the top of the V-block and I don't want the part's perpendicularity to the surface plate to be affected by the force that I'm applying during the layout operation. Now I can set my height gauge to 133. Okay, there you go. Now I'm going to turn the part just slightly to make the blue area a little more accessible because, well, my U-clamp is in the way. Reference against the surface plate, very important. And now we can lay out our line. Well, as you can see, I just barely made it up to the edge of the layout die, but I have enough line there to work with. And now we can lay out the overall length line. Then we can surface up to that line to get our 236 overall length. And that'll be more than accurate enough because the length tolerance on this part is quite slack. And come and lay out my last line. So there you go. I have my three lines. 15, 133, and 236. Now we're going to head over to the lathe and surface the second end, the one that I haven't touched yet, down to this line. And as I said, that'll be more than accurate enough for the overall length. Then I'm going to come and drill my center hole. But this time, I'm going to use a number four center drill. 
So this is my first end, the reference, and I'm going to insert that end into the three jaw chuck. Note that I put the part quite deeply into the three jaw chuck, so I don't want it to stick out any more than it has to. I'm going to start by surfacing and then I'm going to produce my number four center hole. And for the surfacing I'm going to reduce my speed to around 550 RPM. So, now I'm going to remove my cutting tool, but I won't put it too far because I'm going to need it again. And I'll replace my cutting tool with a knurling tool. And a knurling is what we're going to start our next video with. So have fun, be safe, and happy machining.